This video is an update on new developments in macular degeneration. Hello, my name is Craig Blackwell. I'm an ophthalmologist in Santa Cruz, California. Since our last videos about macular degeneration, there have been significant new developments. In the previous videos, we looked at how the aging process affects the retina, how that turns into AMD, and the available treatments. This video is an update on what is new. We will start with a brief review of the aging retina and its evolution into macular degeneration. Then we will look at a newly recognized mechanism of damage, complement activation. We will cover new treatments in development for both dry and wet AMD and update the progress with the artificial retina. Remember, this is for your information and does not replace consultation with your ophthalmologist. The retina is a layer of nerve tissue lining the inside of the eye. It functions like film in a camera. This is what it looks like if we look through the pupil into the inside of the eye. On the left, the arrow points to the optic nerve. You can see arteries and veins branching out from the middle of the nerve. The rest of what you see is the center part of the retina. The outer white ring denotes the macula, the part of the retina responsible for good central vision. The inner ring denotes the fovea, which has the best fine detail vision. If you take a slice through the retina and look at it through a microscope, you would see these layers. It's a little disorienting at first because light comes in from the top and must filter through the top and middle layers to reach the photoreceptors in the bottom layer. The rods and cones are the cells that sense light and generate nerve impulses, which go through several intermediate cells that eventually carry the nerve impulses to the brain. We will narrow our focus further to the lower half of the retina and its supporting structures. The rods and cones we were just referring to have their ends enveloped by a layer of square-shaped cells called the retinal pigment epithelium, abbreviated RPE. These cells are very important because they support the metabolism of the rods and cones. The blood vessels that supply oxygen and nutrients to the lower half of the retina are located in a layer called the choroid. Separating retina and choroid blood vessels is a barrier layer called Bruch's membrane. It separates the cell layers while allowing oxygen and nutrients to pass through to the retina. Changes in this bottom layer of the retina are responsible for what happens in the retina with aging and macular degeneration. Here is a normal retina in middle age. Note the nice, even orange color. And here is a retina of an older person. What do you notice? In the center, there are little yellow or white dots. These are called drusen. They are deposits of waste material underneath the retina. This diagram shows what is happening within the retina with aging. Deposits of waste material under the RPE cells are the drusen you saw in the last picture. These are the visible hallmark of an aging retina. But there are other things happening that you cannot see. The RPE cells, after a lifetime of digesting the end segments of the rods and cones, eventually become glutted with debris, lose function, and begin to die off. Bruch's membrane becomes thicker, meaning less oxygen and nutrients are able to pass through to reach the retinal cells. And over time, the number of capillaries supplying the retina decreases also meaning less blood supply is available. In this diagram, we are trying to show how the aging changes we just talked about, which are listed at the left, evolve into macular degeneration. The steps in the aging process that mediate damage involve oxidation, inflammation, and reduced blood supply. And so happens the damage to the RPE cells, which constitutes dry macular degeneration. In talking about macular degeneration, you typically hear the terms dry kind and wet kind. Let us think about the dry kind as the path the aging retina usually follows. In the process, what you can see is the gradual buildup of drusen. What you cannot see are the number of other processes going on that cause increasing stress on the RPE cells, which eventually cause them to die off. As RPE cells are lost, the photoreceptors they support also die off. The end stage of this dry pathway is called atrophic or geographic macular degeneration. Seen here is the pale area indicated by the arrows. 
central vision here is lost just as surely as by any other mechanism of retinal damage. While the so-called dry process is slowly marching on, sometimes it can branch off along another path, the wet kind, which means it can suddenly switch on growth of new blood vessels under the retina, which may seem like a good idea, but is actually bad news. This illustration shows how the wet kind comes about. One of the causes of damage to the retina, you remember, is reduced oxygen supply. That causes the struggling cells of the retina to produce a chemical called VEGF, a substance that promotes new blood vessel growth. The left half of the diagram shows where those new blood vessels are located. Here you can see the tendril of a new vessel breaking through Bruch's membrane, invading the space under the retina. This is an ominous development because the new vessels are fragile. They leak, bleed, and bring scar tissue under the retina, causing rapid, significant loss of vision. Now that you have seen how macular degeneration comes about, let's talk about treatment. For dry AMD, AREDS-1 showed that taking extra antioxidant vitamins and the mineral zinc significantly slow the progress of AMD, but don't reverse any changes. Shown here are the results of AREDS-1. Following the success of that study, a follow-up, AREDS-2, has added new elements thought to be helpful. They have added lutein, zeaxanthine, and omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids. In addition, they have removed beta-carotene and lowered the amount of zinc. This is a five-year study that closed recruitment in 2008. In the next few years, they should start to publish their results and we will have some interesting new information. Treatment of wet AMD made a great leap in progress a few years back with the appearance of the VEGF inhibitors, Avastin and Lucentis. Instead of the usual progressive loss, vision could stabilize or even sometimes improve. Details of these treatments are covered in the previous videos. Now we're on to what's new. Since the last video, one of the most productive areas of current research regards the role of complement factor H. Accumulating evidence suggests it may have a major role as a cause of AMD through the process of inflammation. The normal function of complement factor H is to prevent your immune system from attacking your own cells. But some people have a defective form of that and thus suffer various injuries by attacking their own cells. This is an important topic, so we'll spend some time explaining the general concepts. First, the complement system is a powerful part of your immune defenses against invaders like bacteria. The complement system involves a group of proteins that are normally circulating in your bloodstream, lying dormant until activated by a chemical signal. This diagram shows an antibody recognizing a foreign invader cell, like a bacteria, and attaching itself to that cell. That causes a protein called C1 to become active, which triggers a cascade of chemical events, like a row of falling dominoes. Without listing all the middle steps, eventually C5 becomes active, and joining with other proteins forms the deadly membrane attack complex, abbreviated MAC. The MAC attacks the wall of the target cell, drills a hole in it, which results in death of that cell. This is a powerful weapon your body has to kill unwanted cells. Now here are two additional things to think about. Sometimes the cascade can become activated by an alternate pathway without requiring a foreign invader. Which leads to a big question. How is this system, which is poised for destruction, kept under control so it doesn't attack your own normal cells? That is where complement factor H comes in. It is one of several substances responsible for holding the complement cascade in check so it doesn't attack your own cells. Unfortunately, some people have a mutation in the CFH gene that results in a bl blocker that is not fully functional, allowing the cascade to attack your own cells, which leads us to a new theory that applies to several diseases, one of which is AMD. In the retina, this plays out as allowing the complement system to attack the RPE cells. Bad news. It is now suggested that drusen contained debris accumulating from the war of inflammation. The involvement of the complement system and inflammation is a significant new development 
in our understanding of AMD. Another significant advance is our understanding of the inheritance of AMD. Previously, it was known that the CFH gene was connected to AMD, but not why or how. Now it's clear that there is a defective form of the CFH gene identified as Y402H that is allowing the complement system to attack. This is a compilation of several studies showing how the risk of developing AMD increases with the number of copies you have of the defective CFH gene. You may know we have two copies of most genes. If you have no copies of the defective Y402H, that establishes the baseline risk of one. If you have one copy of the defective gene and one normal copy, the risk doubles. And if both copies are the defective gene, the risk is over six times normal. That is one risk gene. Currently, there is a lot of work going on sorting out candidates for other associated genes. Taking this a step further, if you add the risk associated genes to other risk factors, like overweight and smoking, you get a fuller picture of the total risk. This rather detailed chart shows those combined associations with the Y402H we were just talking about. If you want to digest the details, you can pause the video here. The second chart shows the LOC gene, which is another one found to be associated, but whose function has not yet been identified. These two genes are thought to account for almost two-thirds of the cases of AMD. On top of that are added the effects of overweight and smoking. Now, let us take a look at new developments in treatment. To date, the only treatment for dry AMD was antioxidant vitamins and zinc. Now that CFH has become identified as possibly the main actor, there are several treatment strategies under development attempting to block unwanted activation of the complement system. Here are three examples. One company is working on a short protein chain that would bind to complement factor 3, blocking its participation in the cascade. The second approach is to use an antibody to C5, blocking the cascade further on. And a third strategy is to replace the defective factor H with a synthetic functional factor H. These and other medications are currently undergoing human trials. For treating wet AMD, so far we have mentioned the VEGF inhibitors, Lucentis and Avastin. Here are several examples of medications in development. Note, this is not intended to be a complete list. Avastin and Lucentis act by blocking the action of VEGF, which creates and maintains new vessel growth. They are very effective, but awkward to administer because they have to be injected into the eye about once a month. VEGF trap is also a VEGF blocker, but it has, it has the advantage of longer duration of action. Instead of requiring an injection into the eye every 30 days, VEGF trap theoretically would last 79 days, more than twice as long. Small interfering RNA is one of a new class of medication known as a gene silencing agent. That is, it shuts down the production of VEGF. It's the first therapy based on a technology that won the Nobel Prize. The advantage here is also longer duration of action, so more time between in injections. Tyrosine kinase inhibitors. There are several medications aimed at interfering with VEGF activating the cellular machinery of new vessel growth. These have been shown in preliminary trials to be as effective at getting rid of new vessel growth as the current injectable medications. But their big advantage is that they are administered in drop form. No more injections required. The next development is something I didn't think I would see in my lifetime a functioning artificial retina. There are a number of devices in development. We will look at the device that is furthest along, developed by Dr. Hugh Mayan and his team at USC. The first model, the Argus One, was implanted in 2002, which successfully functioned at a basic level, and they have since implanted an improved model with more visual detail. This is such an interesting subject that it is covered in detail in a separate video. In summary, the process starts with an external camera to record an image, which is sent to a processor unit that takes the real complex image and greatly simplifies it. 
Then the simplified image is sent wirelessly to a receiver attached to the eye. A grid of electrodes is implanted inside the eye against the retina. Impulses from the electrodes stimulate the remaining ganglion cells, mimicking the nerve impulses from the absent photoreceptors. Here's a general idea of how that looks. Take the camera picture, make it black and white. In the first model, the array had 16 electrodes, so the image had to be simplified enough to occupy 16 pixels, a simple 4x4 four four grid. When an electrode in the array is switched on, the user perceives a white dot. Picture a dark background with spots of light, like a constellation in the night sky. Here are the parts of the Argus 2 device. The user wears a pair of glasses with the external camera mounted in front. The antenna on the side transmits the picture information to the eye. The wire in the lower part of the picture connects to the processor, which is not shown. It is a compact unit worn on the belt. This is the part that is attached to the eye. The wire coil acts both as antenna and receives power for the device. The electronics receive and process information. These parts are on the outside of the eye. A small incision is made so the electrode array can be implanted inside the eye and affixed to the retina. Here is a picture of the second Argus model with an array of 60 electrodes in position on the surface of the retina. You can see the optic nerve as the yellow circle on the right. The electrode array is positioned over the macula where the center of the vision would be. Linda Morefoot is one of the first people to receive the implant. Here is how it affected her life. Quote, I see where the kitchen table and counters are, and I don't knock glasses over anymore. Now I can follow the action after my grandchild hits the ball in a Little League game. End quote. In spring of 2011, this device was approved in Europe and is awaiting FDA approval in the U.S. As of this writing, we are in the middle of a period of rapid progress in understanding and treating AMD, a disease that once seemed untouchable. There is a lot of promise in the next few years.